Hello and welcome to today's webinar on implementing primary care value-based payment through Medicaid managed care made possible by the Commonwealth Fund. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly go over a few logistics. To eliminate background noise, phone lines are being muted during today's event. There will be a moderated question and answer session following today's presentations. You may submit a question online anytime by clicking the Q&A icon located at the bottom of your screen. Instructions are shown on the screen at this time. Today's event will be recorded and the slides and recording will be shared publicly on chcs.org. At the end of the webinar, we ask that you please complete a brief online evaluation that will pop up on your screen. Your feedback is very important to us and we hope that you'll take a moment to do this. I'll now turn the webinar over to Rob Houston, Director at the Center for Healthcare Strategies. Thank you, Travis. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar today. Uh, before we get started, I'd want to share a little information about the Center for Healthcare Strategies if you're not familiar with our organization. We are a nonprofit policy center dedicated to improving the health of low income Americans. Um, focusing on three uh, particular areas, uh, integrating services for people with complex needs, building Medicaid and cross-sector leadership capacity, and advancing delivery system and payment reform, which we will be discussing on today's webinar. Next slide. This webinar today is part of our Strengthening Primary Care Through Medicaid Managed Care webinar series, which is made possible by our friends at the Commonwealth Fund. This series is, is primarily to examine the tools and levers that states can use to advance comprehensive primary care strategies. There is many webinars to come. We had one last month. We look forward to you all joining on uh, future webinars as well. Um, the information on future webinars, as well as some resources, including our Advancing Primary Care Innovation and Medicaid Managed Care Toolkit, uh, please visit uh, the website indicated on the slide currently. Next slide. Through these webinars and through the tools on our website, we are going to explore some core features of advanced primary care and levers to drive uptake and spread. This visual graphic that we have here, um, the circle on the top is indicating core, te core features of advanced primary care and the three boxes on the bottom are levers to drive uptake and spread. Um, we, our first webinar in the series was on enhanced team, enhancing T-based care. You'll note the check mark next to that box because we've done it. Today, we're focusing on the move to value-based payment and primary care lever. Next slide. So our learning objectives for today are to learn how states, payers, and providers can leverage value-based payment to support delivery system transformation goals, understand how these VEC models can incentivize and support health equity, and also understand how prospective payment models can support high-quality primary care. Next slide. Our agenda will start off with some quick introductions. We'll discuss state approaches for supporting value-based payment in primary care. Guest speakers will speak to leveraging the VVP models to reduce health, reduce health disparities and also implementing prospective payment models to advance primary care. We'll have some moderated Q&A and then we'll wrap up and preview future sessions. Next slide. So quickly for introductions. Um, as I mentioned, I'm Rob Houston, Director of Delivery System and Payment Reform at CHCS. My colleague, Kelsey Breichman, a senior program officer at CHCS, will also be providing the value-based payment overview. And then we have three special guests, all very happy to have them on this webinar. Dr. Len Nichols, Emeritus Professor of Health Policy at George Mason University and a non-resident fellow at the Urban Institute Health Policy Center. Uh, we're also joined by Dr. Anthony Marinello from uh, CDPHP and Dr. Adetu to Adetona, owner and president of Lansingburg Family Practice in New York State. So at this point, I will uh, pass the uh, baton over to my colleague, Kelsey Breitman, who will walk us through uh, our next section. Kelsey? Thank, yes, thank you, Rob, and welcome everyone. 
So to begin today's webinar, uh, I'm going to provide uh, an overview of state approaches and opportunities for supporting value-based payments in primary care. Before getting in the weeds, um, just to take a moment to provide some grounding in what we mean by value-based payment. Uh, in short, value-based payment models are payment models that explicitly tie provider payment to quality or efficiency measures. Value-based payment can include a wide range of models with varying levels of provider risk and incentives for improved quality. Oh, next slide. And actually, next slide, apologies, forgot to switch it there. So currently, uh, states are leveraging a variety of strategies for incentivizing value-based payment through Medicaid managed care, ranging from flexible to prescriptive approaches. States that aim to maximize flexibility in value-based payment uh, may consider setting broad value-based payment targets or requirements uh, in MCO contracts. States can also be prescriptive in value-based payment adoption by requiring MCOs to participate in specific value-based payment models. So for example, um, states can require um, models with standardized design elements, such as, defined, such as a defined measure set um, or defined payment methodology. Some states are also taking a, a middle ground between flexibility and prescriptiveness through means such as setting um, you know, high level value-based payment guidelines and, and contacts, but allowing a good, a good deal of flexibility there. Next slide. So um, how can value-based payment support, uh, improve, support improve primary care delivery? BDP can be used in concert with other managed care contracting levers to incentivize and provide resources for high quality primary care. Specifically, through value-based payment, um, payment can be directly linked to primary care-related quality measures to incentivize quality improvement. Additionally, uh, value-based payment can potentially support uh, increased financial stability for practices. So for example, during COVID-19, many practices in fever service faced financial instability uh, when in-person visits dropped. VBP models uh, that move away from value-based payment can support stability uh, in such cases. Value-based payment can also allow more flexibility for providers to invest in innovative care models. So for example, models that support uh, integration of behavioral health into primary care um, or models supporting um, addressing, social, addressing health-related social needs. Value-based payment can also be a way to support investment in primary care. So um, you know, one goal of value-based payment is often cost savings. However, there's evidence that in the US, um, there's currently underinvestment in primary care. VBP can potentially support increased investment in primary care, um, reducing total cost of care down the line. So through these various levers, VBP can incentivize and support primary care uh, that's comprehensive and coordinated, patient-centered, accessible, as well as equitable. While there are many ways that VBP can support primary care goals, um, today's webinar is going to particularly focus on two opportunities for states and managed care plans as they continue to iterate and advance uh, their VBP approaches. So the first is leveraging primary care value-based payment to advance health equity. The second is using prospective payment models to support enhanced primary care. So now I'm going to go a little deeper uh, to give an intro to each one of those in, in turn. Next slide. So COVID-19 um, and the amplification of longstanding health disparities faced by communities of color has really highlighted the imperative for stakeholders to drive more equitable approaches to care. Value-based payment is one of the levers that states and plans are exploring to reduce disparities and health advance equity. Intentionally designing value-based payment programs to address and promote health equity is promising for a few reasons. One, uh, making health equity an explicit goal of value-based payment can provide direct financial resources and rewards to addressing disparities. Additionally, applying a health equity lens uh, to value-based payment is necessary to avoid unintentionally increasing disparities. So for example, it's important to adequately reimburse and not unfairly penalize providers serving populations experiencing disparities. 
Value-based payment can also help spur improved data collection, which is critical to identifying disparities and measuring progress. And finally, embedding health equity into VDP programs can be an important aspect of aligning health equity goals across states and Medicaid programs. So uh, while states um, are currently in the early stages of, of building health equity into value-based payment design, um, there are some examples uh, of folks already going a step in this direction. So just one example, um, in Minnesota, ACOs are required to create a program addressing a critical social need. As a part of that, um, that program must include a set of health equity measures that intend to reduce health disparities. Next slide. So another area where we are seeing particular uh, opportunity for, for innovation in primary care value-based payments is increased use of prospective payment models. Prospective payment models are upfront payments that are not tied to specific service codes. So, um, so under you know, fee-for-service, um, which is often kind of the current model, um, that incentivizes a high volume of short visits and often inadequately reimburses primary care providers for high value services. As such, states are increasingly exploring prospective payment models to offer more flexibility and more financial stability to primary care providers. So um, how to do this? There, there are a variety of ways that states and plans um, can consider implementing prospective payment models um, with varying levels of financial risk, depending on provider capabilities. So um, to begin the transition to prospective payment, payers can consider providing supplemental per member month payments on top of fee-for-service to support enhanced primary care. For more advanced practices, states and managed care plans may consider fully capitated models, which provide significantly more flexibility, but also increased financial risk. To bridge the transition between fee for service and capitation, um, another option uh, that some are considering is hybrid partially capitated models. The, the flexibility of prospective payment um, paired with, with quality incentives can be a powerful tool to support uh, a variety of state um, care delivery goals within, within primary care. Um, again, as with, as with health equity, um, many states are kind of in the early stages of considering how to kind of pursue these types of models, um, but there are certainly some examples out there now. Um, so as one example, um, Washington State Medicaid uh, is currently working to implement a multi-payer primary care value-based payment model that shifts away from fee service to use of a prospective comprehensive primary care payment that covers a comprehensive set of services. Next slide. So uh, in short, um, value-based payment is a key lever for supporting a wide range of primary care delivery goals. And states are increasingly implementing primary care value-based payment models within Medicaid managed care. Two particular areas of opportunity for innovation are applying a health equity lens to value-based payment, as well as increasingly adopting prospective payment models. So for the remainder of this webinar, I'm going to turn it over to my fellow speakers to provide a deep dive into examples of value-based payment models that feature these two innovative approaches. First up, I'd like to introduce Dr. Glenn Nichols, who's going to speak to his experience in implementing a value-based payment program with a focus on health equity. Dr. Nichols is a non-resident fellow at the Urban Institute and professor emeritus at George Mason University, where he plans to continue his recent work on financing social determinants of health. He has been involved in health reform and policy development for over 20 years, working with national and state policymakers to add moral arguments in technical health policy debates. So with that, I uh, welcome and we'll turn it over to Dr. Nichols. Thank you, Kelsey. I appreciate that. And, and you can tell perhaps from the title of my talk, you may be wondering why are we talking about uninsured patients? And the answer is because I'm going to talk about research that's a few years old, but it was among the first to deal with, uh, I would say, linking payment reform with health equity uh, and, and through reducing disparities in, in health outcomes. And I, I think when I describe the situation I was able to research, you'll understand why we think it's applicable to Medicaid. So I'm gonna talk about the partners and the goals and, and what uh, we were doing in, in Fairfax County, Virginia with the Community Health, health Care Network. 
um, talk about the research question and the statistical models we used and some root cause analysis, and then talk about what at least I think this might mean um, for the future. Um, in, in 2014, you may know, you may remember the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Finding Answers Program. That's the program that was then run by Marshall Chen. It's evolved into it achieving health equity, as you know. Um, they had a very innovative RFP that tried to marry the side of the house that dealt with payment reform and the equity side of the house. And so they said basically uh, <laughs> proposed to test uh, an existing payment model that could be applied to reducing um, health disparities. And it turns out uh, George Mason, where I was at the time, was successful in getting uh, that grant support and Fairfax County and Molina were, were basically just perfect partners to do this, this kind of work. What was going on was Fairfax County, you may know in Virginia, 1.2 million people, relatively high income, does not have FQHCs, but they have about 200,000 uninsured residents and uh, the county runs what you and I might call FQ lookalikes and essentially pays for them uh, by, by contracting services for an operator to, to operate the clinics. And Molina had the contract to operate the clinics in 2014. So the county contracted with Molina. And the reason I think this is applicable to Medicaid is because the county's contract essentially gives them a lump sum and tells them to go forth and provide services to the people who come to the clinic and air conditions and rules, but essentially it's just like uh, PMPM for, uh, for a health plan. And, and during the process, during the three years of the grant, Molina decided to pull out of Virginia. They were hoping Medi Medicaid expansion would happen sooner than it did. Ultimately they left and uh, ANOVA, the local very large uh, hospital system took over operation of the CHCN, the, the community healthcare network. And they, um, uh, basically assumed uh, part and parcel of the pilot we had running and, and you know, uh, God bless them for not uh, changing anything important, but there were some changes that occurred to that and, and we'll talk about that. And so uh, what we hoped, of course, was to provide something beyond research that would actually be helpful to the patients and clinicians of Fairfax County. This is a map that shows you the three clinics. You can't really see the scale, but they're about five miles apart or sometimes three bus lines. And so they are quite dispersed. Fairfax County is quite large. About 15,000 unduplicated patients were normal uh, in a given year, about 50,000 visits. Two thirds of the patients speak Spanish. One third of the patients speak 55 other languages. It's quite a diverse county. Every clinician in the clinics was required to be bilingual in Spanish and English. Some of them spoke a few other languages, but by and large, the non English or Spanish speakers were accommodated who needed it with the translation line. And the county spends about seven to, to $9 million a year on this. The, the patients pay a sliding fee scale like, like normal FQ sorts of collections. And they also uh, had some 340B sources of income. Um, the logic diagram of the intervention was essentially to create a team payment incentive. And I emphasize the word team because the incentive did not flow just to the clinicians, to the doctors who may have been in charge of ordering the tests that eventually were focused on, but um, uh, the entire clinical team, the entire staff of the clinic. So all the way down to the receptionist, all the way up to the, to the uh, PNPs and, 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 and uh, PCPs themselves. And that meant for a team approach, which turned out to be fairly useful, we think. The incentive, of course, was coupled with their, their huddles. They had a daily huddle. They had weekly meetings. They talked about this uh, in, in initiative for quite some time to focus because they genuinely wanted to improve their uh, uh, CQM performance. Within each of these clinics, there's county staff, and those county staff are, are social workers and, and um, nutrition educators, and, and they serve to enable a warm handoff to a referral for someone who may have a, a health-related social need or may need uh, counseling on, on nutrition and make that uh, available as easy as possible. And what we brought to the equation was to look at the data. And I, I put this in the diagram because it turned out, like all good people, when I approached the clinician, the CMO of the clinic, I said, would you be a partner in this work? She said, sure, Lynn, but we treat all patients the same. I said, I'm sure you do. Let's just look at the data. And it turned out, remember that, that 
demographic mix. Two thirds speak Spanish, every clinician is bilingual in Spanish and English. It turns out when you compare the three metrics they wanted to focus on, cervical cancer screening, uh, hemoglobin A1C control, and hypertension control, for those three metrics, the Hispanic population outperformed the non-Hispanic population. And that was a surprise to some people. It was certainly a surprise to RWJ at the time. And when you think about it hard, though, it probably is driven by language and communication. So when they saw the disparities in their own clinic population, I, I, I've never seen a more palpable, oh my God, we got to fix this. And that, therefore, is part of the logic of the diagram of the intervention. So the way we set up the formula was essentially you had to hit all three components to get anything. The, the, the county agreed to essentially fund a 3% bonus if certain conditions were met. And these three conditions include uh, doing, uh, two conditions include having enough productivity. They measure RDUs just like every other uh, clinical practice in the country. So they knew if they were doing enough RDUs in general, apparently at some point in the past, They'd had some, some issues with clinicians not doing enough. And then they focused specifically on the target RVUs, that is, those RVUs that were related to the services that were focused in, in the pilot that they wanted to try to close the disparity gaps on. And so the idea is you had to have both sort of aggregate productivity and specific productivity uh, targeted to the clinical conditions they were focused on. If you got both of those in the sufficient quantity, then you got the 3% bonus. And remember, that bonus applies to the entire clinic staff, uh, not just the, the physicians who are sort of pulling the ultimate trigger. And uh, okay, so the challenges. Well, first of all, county course and wisdom moved one of the, the major clinic uh, in, the middle, in the middle of the county, four miles west, one year in. Uh, which they didn't consult me on, which has the effect that we were all very nervous about would the patients find the clinic. And, and sort of amazingly, uh, there wasn't very much drop off. There was a little bit at first, but they seemed to find it back uh, in time. A whole new operator came in in 2016. So two years in, a big time, I'd call it, you know, very modern uh, health system took over. They had their own very serious EHR targets and, and, and managerial expertise as well as um, ways of, of giving bonuses to their workers. And they basically embedded our pilot inside their larger incentive scheme. So they preserved it for the point uh, to the point of the, of, the, of the time period involved. So what did we find? Well, we can show you lots of statistics, but essentially what it came down to is we did apparent, observe that uh, essentially once you control for center specific differences in time trends, the payment incentive introduction was associated with a reduction in disparities in blood pressure control in all three centers. And it was not due to uh, basically making the Hispanics worse, but making the non-Hispanics perform better. So it was, it was everything moving in the right direction to reduce that disparity gap. We did not see statistically significant impact in hemoglobin A1C and uh, cervical cancer screening, however, but we did see in, in blood pressure control. Now, uh, ANOVA always does a patient satisfaction survey. So at the end, in the third year, we, we piggybacked on their existing typical patient satisfaction survey and added two questions. Did you have one of our three target conditions? And did treatment for that change in the last three years? And then we did a simple probe on those results. And we found that the marginal effect uh, of uh, saying yes to did the, did the treatment change in the last three years was strong for uh, if you just had one and, and very strong 0.74 if you had more than one of the three conditions. So this was a, a result of a root cause analysis that we did to try to ask why didn't we have an effect on hemoglobin A1C control. We also did it for cervical cancer screening, but for time I'll just show you this one. And I would say there's a mix of, of uh, of reasons uh, that we thought, or the staff thought, uh, was the reason we didn't we didn't see much movement. Number one, there was a diabetic education program. It was designed to be given once uh, in three hours, and turns out for a lot of folks who were uh, using this clinic, uninsured, right? You got to prove you in the county and you're uninsured. A lot of folks using that clinic three hours is a long time, and they couldn't always get childcare and bus care and so forth. And so what the, what the clinic actually did was offer folks who needed the diabetic education, who had, who had diabetes, they offered them a voucher 
to uh, get a basically a wave of your next visit fee. Remember, there's a sliding scale fee. You get a waiver of that, so it's like a coupon for a free visit if you attend the session. Well, it turns out when we did the focus group, some of the clinic staff did not know about the incentive program, and certainly it's true that a lot of the patients did not did not know by definition. So, so that was one of the reasons we also learned that you know in many people's home country. Uh, insulin is, is not so commonly given, and it's only given uh, at the end, and so it comes to be associated with death, and so they're kind of afraid of insulin, and, and that carried over into some of the conversations, as well as the obvious problem, diabetes is sort of asymptomatic for a long time. It's hard to get folks to, to be where they want to be, and of course, we believe that the language barriers in communication were uh, always present because translation lines are only as good as translator and there's quite a bit of variance there as you may know. So let's uh, next slide. Okay, limitations. Yeah, uh, I didn't have enough money from RWJ, God bless them, to have a bona fide control group. So it really is just pre post. And, and for that reason, I think, um, you know, it obviously just suggested. Uh, and, and it's also true, we don't really know exactly what happened in those weekly huddles and daily huddles and, and weekly meetings and how often the feedback loop of, uh, of uh, performance intervention. It was tracked on a monthly basis and they were given the data on a monthly basis, but we don't really know exactly what kind of communication went on. Still, the fact that the disparities were reduced and were, were reduced uh, through a team incentive does seem to suggest one might and explore doing this for real in a, in a modern value-based payment program. And uh, we certainly expected to, to continue to work with those folks, but basically over time, Fairfax County decided to contract with a neighboring county's uh, federally qualified health center, Neighborhood Health, which is a very good FQHC. They basically figured out how to let Neighborhood Health come in and take over these sites as a satellite of the home base in, in Alexandria. And, and when I talked to the, to the CMO there, he was all for continuing this, but then COVID hit and everybody got busy. So we have not followed up. Okay, I'll turn it over to uh, Ann. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Nichols, for, for sharing that work. Um, and now I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Anthony Marinello um, and Dr. Edetutu Edetona, who will speak to their experiences implementing and working the prospective payment model for primary care. Um, so Dr. Anthony Marinello is a family physician who now works as the Executive Vice President and CMO at Capital District Physicians Health Plan. While working as a provider, Dr. Marinello piloted CGPHP's Enhanced Primary Care Program. Since then, EPC has grown to include over 200 uh, primary care providers and has received national recognition for its ability to improve quality care while lowering costs. Dr. Eddie Tutu Edaytona is an accomplished family physician in the capital region of New York State. In addition to owning and operating a private practice in an underserved area, Dr. Edaytona serves on the board of directors for CDPHP and the Alliance for Better Health. She also serves on the Enhanced Primary Care Advisory Board for CDPHP. So with that, uh, welcome Dr. Marinello. Thank you, Kelsey. Uh, I love the opportunity to address this group. Could I have the next slide, please? So Capital District Physicians Health Plan is a physician-founded and governed not-for-profit network model health plan. We originally started in the four counties of the Capital District of Upstate New York, which would be Albany, Schenectady, Saratoga, and Rensselaer counties. We have, we have now gone into 29 counties in upstate New York, going as far north as Clinton County along the Canadian border, uh, as far south as Orange County, and as far west as Tioga County. For those geograph geography nuts who are on the participating list today. Uh, we have uh, 400,000 members in all lines of business. And through our networks, we have over 800,000 providers throughout the country. Next slide, please. We call our primary care value-based program Enhanced Primary Care. We are a nationally recognized patient-centered medical home model. What that allows, it allows 
our doctors to spend more time with our members. We've asked them to expand the practice hours to have evening hours and weekend hours. We hope that this has advanced and enhanced the doctor patient relationship. And we've been able to show a higher quality of care as well as a lower cost of care. And we've also improved the electronic communications, not only from our member to their providers, but also from the providers to the health plan. Can I have the next slide, please? So the basis of this is paying doctors for better and not more care. The cornerstone of our model is a practice transformation, which allows practices to get off what I call the hamster wheel of uh, churning visits and to truly provide uh, care uh, to where care is needed. In addition, uh, there's payment reform as well as interoperability. So our EPC practices are reimbursed about 40% higher than uh, the fee-for-service equivalent. And that includes Medicaid managed care. Our EPC program is for all lines of business, commercial, managed Medicaid, Medicare Advantage, and some of our ASO clients have opted in. In addition, we have the, op we have the opportunity to, to pay a bonus of 20%, which is available to the EPC providers based on triple aim goals. And we find that this has been a very effective way of increasing the compensation of our primary care network while increasing the quality of care that's delivered to our members. Can I have the next slide? In the last year or two, we've also added some quality aligned incentive payments. And I showed this depression screening as an example. In 2019, we had 51,000 PHQ-9s uh, reported to us. Also in 2019, we noted an unexpected rise in emergency room and urgent care visits for anxiety and depression. So we decided to put in a quality of life incentive payment for our primary care network to do PHQ-9s for patients that uh, present to their office for whatever, whatever reason. We paid them an additional stipend outside the monthly global payment that we pay them now. And so we've had over 90,000 PHQ-9s done in 2020. Uh, now 2020 is a hard year to measure the effectiveness of reducing emergency room visits and urgent care uh, because of the pandemic. And so we continued this program in 21 and we'd like to see uh, some of the benefits from um, our members uh, self-reporting uh, any uh, risk for depression and anxiety. Could I have the next slide, please? So when COVID-19 hit, our top priority was to protect our independent practices. We immediately reached out to providers and asked them how we could help. We created an advanced payment program with zero interest loans to those specialty groups which are in our network. We also waive cost share for all COVID-19 testing and treatment. We also expanded access to new no-cost telehealth and mental telehealth. And we implemented payment parity for telehealth. During COVID-19, our primary care network was not impacted by a reduction in their in-person visits. 95% of our primary care pr practices are on global payments pre-COVID and by continuing to pay their monthly global payment, we were able to stem the financial devastation that many primary care providers across the country have suffered as a result of COVID-19. 
Next slide, please. So one such practice is Lansingburg Family Medicine, which is in Troy, New York. Troy is in Rensselaer County, which is east of Albany County. Uh, this is Dr. Adetona's practice. She's a solo practitioner with five employees and has been a certified patient-centered medical home site for 2000, since 2013. She serves a low income community with nearly 3,000 patients who are primarily Medicaid. Dr. Adetona ranks among the top providers in our primary care network for quality, efficiency, and patient satisfaction, showing that our model works extremely well with the Medicaid population. Uh, so uh, that's the highlight of our enhanced primary care program. And now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Adetone. Thank you, Tony. Thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'd like to start off by telling you a story of a patient of mine. I refer to her as Mary. Mary is a 65 year old lady who was new to me. In fact, she became my lady when I was preparing for this webinar. She hadn't received any treatment for over three years. When I said to her, why haven't you been to any provider? She said to me that um, her previous doctor was sending her everywhere and she wasn't gonna have any of it. Mary, has diabetes, hypertension, COPD, depression, mobility issues, and she's a smoker. When she came into the office, obviously I took her history and I checked her sugar and I did her hemoglobin A1C. Her sugar was just under 350 with her hemoglobin A1C of 15, the maximum my a meter in the office we read was 15. She was greater than 15. Mary at the time she came in um, was on the verge of being very sick. And this is the risk that this lady processes. Number one, she could have turned up in the emergency room with DKA, with diabetic ketoacidosis, ended up in the ICU, admitted to the hospital, then you got to look for rehab. Then you have to also think of all the complications of diabetes, the renal failure, ending up with dialysis, heart disease, stroke, respiratory disease. Not to talk of the fact that she smokes and she's already got COPD. So those are the risks that she possessed on that day or she presented with rather on that day. So what did I do for her? Not only did I take the examination, um, examined her, I was able to do a pap on the day she presented. I didn't have to send her to a GYN. I did a spirometry in the office so that I could show her the state of her lungs. I didn't send her to a pulmonologist. I took a blood work. I didn't send her to the hospital or to any lab. I arranged transportation for her, two transportation, one to enable her to come back to the office to see me and the other transportation so that she could go and get her medication at the pharmacy or if she needs to go buy proper food, nutrition for herself. Then I um, also booked her for a mammogram and also booked her for a colonoscopy. Value-based payment has allowed me to be able to think differently than, I, um, than most of us will have otherwise done. I have been involved with value-based payment for many years. And I'd like to introduce you, the first slide please, to think about um, value-based payment in set of two, three Ps. And when I talk about value-based payment, the time I have is just not enough to tell you about everything that is involved. So I'm just gonna give you an overview. And this is the journey for a typical physician or for, for me um, doing val for value-based payment. Phase one is the introduction. This is the continuation of a relationship that I've developed with CDPHP. 
in which at the beginning of the journey, all I was meant to do is just to achieve some quality measures. And these quality measures were like um, making sure that patients do have the mammogram done, the pap done, focusing on preventive and treating chronic diseases better. The office as well was able to change, we're able to change the way we do things, working as a unit. The second phase, which is the phase that I'm in right now, is the share savings. Share savings happens when the total, what the cost of care is less than the predicted cost. You create a positive margin and you share with the uh, with the payers in the in the savings. The phase three is rolling, coming along soon. This is when the provider now assumes total risk. You're completely responsible for the care of the patient. Second slide, please. Next slide, please. So this is second set of the three Ps that I call the patient, um, P1, P2, and P3, the provider and the payer. For value-based payment to be effective, the patient has to be engaged. The patient has to be involved. They have to have an understanding of what is going on, that when you present to your provider, it is a safe heaven for everything that you need. Number two, the provider. How do I operate under these circumstances? I just put myself that I am personally responsible with my own private funds that I'm going to use to pay for the care of my patient. And so this enables me to think before I order anything, because think about it. A lot of orders and a lot of healthcare costs really do originate from what we providers do. So I think of the patient in an holistic manner, for, um, treating the patient body, soul, and mind. Every Anything that the, the patient needs is really what I try to provide at the point of contact or the point of care, wherever this, this may be. My office staff as well, We, like I said, we work as a team. We focus completely on the patient, thinking of one patient at a time, looking at what does this patient need? How are we going to get the patient? We think of past, present, and future. What happened in the past? What's happening right now? How am I going to prevent the patient from getting sick? This is how we operate every single day and with every single patient. Now we talk about the payer. The payer is actually the glue between the patient and the provider. And this is what I think for the kind of population we're talking about. They have a lot of social issues. It's not good enough for a payer or an insurance company to assign a patient's name on the patient's card and say, that is your primary provider. I think everybody needs to go for that. The payer, the insurance company will need to reach out to this patient and say, this is your provider. This is our address. This is our phone number. And go as much as go as much as calling that provider's office and say, why don't you do a three-way conversation a, um, call? I'll give you, I'll get you an appointment in this doctor's office because you need to establish with the provider so that when anything is wrong with you, you're not new, you're not strange, and you do not need to go to an emergency room where you're going to wait for hours and really nobody has your history and nobody knows you. The patient in turn will be happy if the payer starts doing that. Um, and then the payers will have to continue. This is what I enjoy with CDPHP. They really have helped me along, along this journey, educating me, supporting me, being resourceful. So I give you an example. With the pandemic, my diabetic retinopathy um, just went down. This is because my patients did not have access to get to see the ophthalmologist. I did call Dr. Marinello. He saw what I was talking about. What did CDPH do? They provided the office with the um, diabetic camera, retinal camera. So we're able to do um, diabetic eye screening when the patient comes to the office. So the payers, like I said to you, will have to continue to build a strong relationship with the provider, making sure that providers do understand what this, this is all about in terms of education, more, re, more resources to, um, to the provider. Um, next slide, please. So like I said earlier on, this process cannot be successful without the patient's buy-in. And we also have to find out about the care, um, the bar 
the um, barrier to care. Like in the patient that I told you, it was so simple what her problem was. She didn't want to start going to see different doctors. And also she didn't have any transportations. These are identified at the time she presented to the office, knew what that problem was. And I wasn't gonna repeat that mistake again. So that is that brings us to addressing social determinant of health. This is a key part in the population that we serve. This has to be addressed and this has to be taken care of so that they can be engaged in their own health issues. Next slide, please. So as mentioned earlier on, this is um, it's an ongoing process, a relationship between the payer, between the payer and the provider, and the, and the provider also you have to be engaged, learning every day, so that we can do what is best for our patient. Next slide, please. It's like I said, a true partnership between the payer and the provider. The payers we all, we are also have to present to the provider, just data and analysis of what is happening, uh, presenting them with um, the performance report. This also helps so that the, the provider can always do the best for the patient. Next slide, please. So this is what I have found out, that this process is a continuous journey, is a marathon. We have to keep at it. We must address the barrier to care this is very important and provide as much service as possible at the point of care. Next slide, please. So what does the future hold? Future holds that at some stage, we providers, we have to assume full risk in order to control the healthcare costs. And it's gonna involve full integration into primary care of a lot of services. One thing that is, to me, that is very much needed in the population that I serve is providing or integrating full behavioral health care into my office. And like anything else, this uh, value-based payment, it's a process, it is a growth, it's like a child, and you have to nurture it, you have to support it so that it doesn't fail. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so now we're entering into our uh, Q&A portion of our webinar. Um, so just as a reminder, if you do have questions, uh, please feel free to submit them uh, through, through the Q&A um, feature in, in Zoom. So um, to kick things off in terms of Q&A, um, we did get one question about how value-based payments applies um, to pediatric populations or, or practices, I guess, pediatric only practices. Um, I'm thinking, I guess, perhaps for, perhaps for Dr. Mariello or, or maybe Dr. Natona, um, I'm wondering if you guys have, have any thoughts uh, on how value-based payment can, can serve um, pediatric populations or, or if there are any, I guess, per particular kind of considerations or, or way that uh, the EPC program is addressing those populations. Yeah, some of our most successful practices are in the pediatric uh, population. Uh, approximately, I think about 15 of our practices are solely pediatric practices. And I think the key to have our practices successful is to provide them with a set of metrics to follow that we want them to uh, engage our members with. For example, immunization rates, lead screening, uh, well child visits. So uh, I think that's the key to all of these value-based programs is aligning the metrics with the practice that uh, these uh, doctors are in, whether it's a practice like that after Adetona or my former practice, which was a family practice and a mix of pediatrics and internal medicine, or whether it's straight internal medicine, we have multiple practices, straight internal medicine. And then, like I said, uh, the pediatric practices that we have. Great, thank you so much. Um, so uh, a question for, I think this is more for Dr. Nichols. Um, can you share a little bit more about uh, the specific uh, metrics you used um, related to health equity in, in, in your research? Sure, so the project I described focused on three um, electronic quality measures, um, cervical cancer screening, 
being a, and for appropriate ages and intervals. Um, hemoglobin A1C control. Uh, and when Dr. Adetona said 15, my skin crawled, I, I knew how dangerous that is. And um, uh, hypertension control, again, age specific. And so they, they really were sort of standard at the time and now meaningful use measures that we thought were clear. They've been in, in the EHR long enough. We thought folks were comfortable with them and, and we believe they were measured accurately. And that, that's the three they chose. Great, thank you. Um, so now again, so switching, switching back over to, to see the uh, PHP, um, or I guess I should say that the EPC model. Um, we have a question about, I guess, how the rates, uh, the global payment rates um, within the enhanced primary care program are developed. I'm wondering if, if you'd be able to speak to that a little bit. But the, the, initially the rates were based on a PCAL, which is a primary care acuity level. We have since, migrated to HCC coding. And so the monthly global payment is calculated by uh, the HCC risk code of, of the members that are attributed to that specific practice. The attribution model uh, begins when someone is seen for a preventive care or uh, for a sick visit. Uh, and that, uh, that uh, imputation lasts for 12 to 18 months. And so each member has a specific risk score and through a mathematical calculation, which is beyond the scope of my brain, uh, it's uh, calculated uh, by our analysts and uh, a monthly global payment is established. And it's, it could be adjusted monthly based on people that drop in or drop out of imputation, as well as the current coding of the risk of the member. So it's a very dynamic number. It's not static for the whole 12 month period. Great, thank you so much for going into that detail. Um, I think we're going to switching again back over to Dr. Nichols. Um, we got another question uh, asking a little more um, about getting in, in the weeds of, of the design of these models. Um, we have a question about uh, if you could speak a little bit more to how uh, the incentive payment in the model you spoke to was distributed, um, as well as just how, how that methodology was, was developed. Um, you know, to what extent were providers involved in development versus just, just payer? Mm -hmm. So great question. And uh, remember that, uh, let's start with the second one first. Remember that the payer here was the county, which paid a fixed amount to the operator of the clinics. And then the operator of the clinics basically decided everything else. And so when it came time to design the payment formula, the CMO of the clinic, the county, uh, I guess you could say representative, uh, and myself, sat in a room and talked about it. <laughs> and we went through all the options that, you know, we all know and all the variations that existed then and exist now. And, and really, I would say a compromise was struck between um, putting folks at risk. The, the somebody, you know, the economist in the room, myself wanted to push harder, but the CMO and the county person pushed back and said, you know, Lynn, we don't pay them that much. We can't be putting people in downside risk. So let's talk about upside. Okay, fine. And then the CMO was more worried about overall productivity in general because they'd had some physicians complaining about other physicians sort of, you know, not working on Friday afternoon, that sort of thing, because they were salaried historically. And so they really wanted that second component of overall productivity to be there. And then the third component was, was driven by, we want to make sure they're focused on the target uh, ECQMs, the target conditions we're trying to affect where the greatest disparities were. And so that's, that's how we got the, the, the formula. I would say the decision to make the uh, uh, incentive apply to the entire clinic was one that um, I, would, I would say the leadership reached in a kind of a general way, but first they presented all this to the, to the teams and said, hey, how would you like to do it? And, and they sort of voted and they, they all, even docs voted for, let's share it. What turned out to be the case we observed was that 3% for a physician is actually sort of less motivating 
and three percent for a medical assistant because that's that medical assistant that that's that's a deal and so they were prodding the docs to be sure you do the right test to be sure you order the email to be sure you order the cervical cancer so it became a team process more than in general because we think the incentive existed so that was that was a good feat Great, thank you so much. Um, and lastly, um, I know we're getting short in time, but for our last question, um, Dr. Edetona, um wanted to, to ask one directed toward, towards you, I think, which is um, some folks are wanting to hear a little bit more about how uh, the enhanced primary care model allowed you to provide, I guess, increased, increased services. Uh, and particularly folks uh, are asking about um, addressing social determinants of health. I know you mentioned, I think a little bit in, in your overview, but wanting to speak a, a little more to that piece. So it's, thank you very much, it's so simple. So you don't have to worry when you focus just on that patient and you know when you get the patient healthy and keep the patient out of the hospital, you're gonna get savings and that's gonna come back to you. So the key is just focus on the patient do everything the patient needs to, to be healthy. So for the social determinant of health, it's really part of my history taking. I go through everything. Who did they live with? What kind of work do they do? Do they have problems with food and everything? And once I identify that, and I have a platform called Unite Us, which is under um, the Hospice of Alliance for Better Health. And it's a, a referral system. It's an umbrella. So whatever problem is identified, right when the patient's in the office, we make the referral. Not only do we make the referral, we make a phone call. This patient speak to somebody on the other line, say, okay, we referred you for X, Y, and Z problem. This person is gonna call you back in a timely fashion. So, and I always say to the patient, if they, they don't call you back, you just make sure you call my office back tomorrow morning so that I make sure that the patient gets what they need. Our, our clientele, when you talk about Medicaid, um, you, we have to look after them. It's like, you have to, look at them like your own child to make sure that everything is delivered to them. And social determinant of health plays a huge role in making them healthy and making them do, get them to where they need to be. I hope that yeah, answers thank the question. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you all of you. Um, I see we're almost at time, so I'm now actually gonna pass it back to Rob just to wrap things up. Thanks, Kelsey, and thank you to Dr. Marinello, Dr. Nichols, Dr. Adetona for, uh, for participating in the webinar. Really enjoyed the discussion. A lot of different uh, positives, uh, I would say, uh, for prospective payments uh, in a primary care setting. So uh, thank everyone for joining this webinar. Um, you can visit chcs.org to access the value-based payment module. There's a, a written uh, portion of our uh, Advancing Primary Care Innovation and Medicaid Managed Care Toolkit, um, particularly addressing value-based payment and models like these. You can go to that uh, for uh, chcs.org to access that. Um, also, uh, look out for upcoming webinars in this series. Our next topic will be on promoting health equity through primary care innovation and Medicaid managed care. You'll want to stay tuned for that one. One way to uh, sign up for uh, to figure that out is to uh, sign up for our mailing list at chcs.org. We'll make sure to tell you when the webinars are coming up. Um, also, and folks have mentioned this before, please complete the evaluation at the conclusion of the webinar. Uh, it should pop up right on your browser. Um, we really do appreciate your feedback and please uh, let us know what you thought about the webinar. So thank you everyone for joining today. Thank you to our speakers and uh, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Sure.